another minute to join. My name is Juan Ortiz Frauler. I am an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. I'm also a PhD student at USC, University of Southern California, Annenberg School of Communication, where I'm a Wallace Annenberg Fellow. And today I will be presenting on the weaponization of corporate infrastructure. Um, there is a paper that goes with this presentation. You can find it on my Twitter handle at one o f nine or on the description for this presentation at the IGF website. So the structure of the presentation, while we wait another moment for people who are joining, I will I will do a quick 15 minute presentation, just giving you an overview of the paper. Throughout the presentation, you will see QR code links in case you want to, in case you would want to um, access the paper in full or, or the references that I'm mentioning. And after that, we'll have an open discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, fantastic. Okay, I'll jump into the presentation um, and then we'll go into uh, questions and discussion. Thank you so much for, for joining me. So, um, presentation overview. First, I'll give you an introduction, uh, the core argument and some core definitions so that we can have a richer discussion. Um, basically, I will be describing three phases of internet governance, uh, taking the perspective uh, of the US government. And then I will be discussing the concept of re-networking, which I think is what we're going through at this point, uh, which is phase three. Uh, which is being shaped by lockouts and blockages. And lastly, I will share with you uh, a brief conclusion. So the core question that I'm, I'm trying to assess is how did we get from global information system to idea of a clean network, which is what I think we're, we're going towards now. So in 1994, US Vice President Al Gore at the ITU meeting in Buenos Aires stated, Legislators, regulators, and business people must do this. Build and operate a global information infrastructure. This global information infrastructure will circle the globe with information superhighways on which all people can travel. In 2020, however, Michael Pompeo, then US Secretary of State, stated, we call on all loving freedom nations and companies to join the clean network. So underlying this whole presentation is the idea that what we commonly discuss as fragmentation is not a bug, but a feature of the redesigning of our global information system as it's being promoted by the US government at this phase. So in terms of key definitions, um, I think one of the core questions is around governance. So I will be discussing governance in terms of uh, Laura Denardis's definition, which is the exercise of power to enact a certain set of public interest goals. And I will be discussing internet governance in terms of the World Summit on the Information and Society, when 2011 stated the development and application by the governments, the private sector and civil society in the respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. And so underlying these two definitions are two big questions, which I think are at the center of what is being discussed at IGF, which is who is being represented and how are their interests being balanced? And how do these the answers to these questions change over time as the internet evolves? Right? If we're discussing internet governance, it's a matter of 
what is internet and also what is governance and how these two definitions interact. So as I was mentioning, the core argument of the paper is that there are three phases of internet governance if we take the perspective of the US government. Um, the first one is this of a global information infrastructure that goes from 1990 to 2001 and is basically the, the quote that I was sharing, where the internet, where it was proclaimed that the internet would be a shared and global resource for human and economic development. After the Twin Tower attacks, however, what we saw was the con consolidation towards a networked global intelligence infrastructure where the US allow the market to consolidate around a handful of US multinational companies and where it leveraged multinational companies to forward narrow geopolitical goals. So we will see that the Department of Defense starts pulling data from its targets and we start seeing the Department of State push data into countries um, that are trying to stop that data from circulating. After 2016, with the victory of Donald Trump, we saw a realignment and re-networking towards a post-global information infrastructure. And there it says 2021, but it should be ongoing. Okay. So somehow this, give me a moment, it seems to have. There we go. Um, and so, Basically, in this third phase, what we see is that the US is undermining established global governance mechanisms and fora. And we see that the Department of Treasury is um, deploying cut powers, uh, creating digital lockouts through which it shapes the process of renetworking. So, throughout the presentation, you will see some QR codes. Uh, it's simply for you to access the paper as such in case you would like to see the references or the graphs. Um, and so these three case, these three powers, as mentioned, are, are being promoted and leveraged by three different departments uh, within the US government. So I argue that the Department of Defense, the Department of State, and the Department of Treasury are deploying different powers, often in contradiction, often in, in ways that do not help the other department operate. And that is why we see uh, these powers being enacted in, in a way that is sometimes uh, contradictory, sometimes chaotic. Sometimes we see that, um, for example, uh, a digital lockout is being promoted by the Department of Treasury, and then uh, that is scaled back very shortly. This was the case, for example, of Adobe in Venezuela, where the Department of Treasury announced that uh, Venezuelans would lose access or Adobe announced that the Department of Treasury was having them uh, cut access in, in Venezuela. And before it was even enacted, uh, they, were given, um, they were given permission to continue operating in Venezuela. And one would assume that what is happening is also that the Department of State and the Department of Defense are in conversation with people at the Department of Treasury. And so these powers are being leveraged um, characteristically in, in phase two, we see uh, pull powers and push powers. And in phase three, we see the growth of the lockout powers. So you can access this uh, through the paper uh, in, the, in the QR. So in phase one, as I was mentioning uh, some key events, what we see is this, this post um, post-nation state infrastructure. The idea is that we're gonna have a network society. Uh, and so in 1993, for example, we see that the web is being released into the public domain. We see that the US Department of Justice opens an investigation into Microsoft's monopolistic practices. Al Gore announces this information infrastructure at ITU. And shortly after we see the launching of many companies that have become core to the internet infrastructure today, like Amazon, like eBay, um, at that point, Internet Explorer, for example. Um, so th there was this idea that the internet would be a shared open resource global uh, on a post nation um, infrastructure. In phase two, however, what we see is that the US government allowed the market to consolidate around some US corporations. We saw that the internet is reconceptualized as a tool for warfare. 
one through which information can be secretly pulled for targets. So this is PRISM, this is Patriot Act, tools that are in the hand of the Department of Defense and pushed onto targets. Um, for example, uh, targets who are limited, who are trying to limit the circulation. And for example, we see the launch of Tor, the Open Tech Fund, Zunzuneo in Cuba, uh, tools in the hands of the Department of State. And so, although consolidation may not have been planned, it is essential to the effectiveness of the push and pull power. So by the end of this phase, around 43% of the world population is using the internet. And so I want to underline that consolidation may not have been planned, but it is essential to the effectiveness of the push and pull powers. And so, for example, in his book, Permanent Record, Edward Snowden stated, so much of the infrastructure of the internet is under US control that over 90% of the world's internet traffic passes through technologies developed, owned, and or operated by the American government and American businesses, most of which are physically located on American territory. So this is one of the slides that, that was released by the Washington Post. Um, and so we can see that at, at the top uh, left that it says the US as a world's communications, telecommunications backbone, right? If in the first phase it was that this was global information infrastructure, the way it was being framed at this point by the intelligence community was um, that this was the backbone of uh, that the US was operating as the world's backbone, right? So it flipped that idea on its head. And what we also see in terms of consolidation is that with just $20 million per year, PRISM was getting access to the content of hundreds of millions of people. Um, and so listed there are some of the companies that are you know, core to, to the way in which most people across the world engage over the internet. So this includes companies like Google, like Facebook, like Microsoft, like Apple. So in phase three, from 2016 to the present, um, what we see is, is uh, the scaling back of, of the US. So what we see is that Trump, for example, withdraws the US from the TPP deal. Uh, the WTO fails to deliver the preferred US outcomes on digital trade. Uh, we see that Huawei and ZTE equipment start being banned from being used uh, within the US and that campaign spreads towards Europe, for example. Uh, we see that the US bans Iranians from accessing GitHub, Amazon, the AWS, um, US bans and then goes back uh, in terms of Venezuelans accessing Adobe. Um, Google pulls Huawei's Android license. And then we see, for example, that the EU court valid, uh, invalidates uh, the, the EU US data protection shield and a number of other uh, actions. And so the underlying causes for this, I believe, is that the rel is the relative decrease in the user, the US user base as a proportion of the global internet user base. So there starts to be a legitimacy gap between the power that is being exercised or that the US government is trying to exercise and the amount of users that it can claim to be representing. And on the other hand, the US's failure to assert its unilateral control over the internet or achieve its desired outcomes in the existing forum. So this leads to a fallout with the big tech companies um, that are now seeing that you know, the US doesn't provide necessarily a large pot of users, um, and also that the US government is not being able to defend uh, these corporate interests through the existing fora, whilst it's asking for a lot of uh, favors that some of these other countries might consider problematic. So, as I was saying, the US uh, went from representing almost 80% of internet users in 1990 to around 7.5% in 2022, whereas, for example, China went from representing 0% of internet users in 1994 to 20% in 2022. Um, and so the current tensions reflect the struggle uh, of the global internet governance systems to keep pace with the communities they seek to serve these questions of who is the public, whose interests are to be served. And so I think one of the key concerns of the US government is that the push and pull networks that are now central to its uh, Department of Defense and Department of State could fall into the wrong hands, right? So it created the centralized uh, machine and that that machine could become unresponsive to the US government and start responding to some other power. And so in one of the congressional hearings, uh, Congressman Getz from the Re 
uh, from Florida, for example, asks, Mr. States, Mr. Zuckerberg in his written testimony made, made the claim that Facebook is an American company with American values. Do any of the rest of you take a different view? That is to say that your companies don't embrace American values. So everyone's nodding. And then he says, it's great to see that none of you do. Mr. Pichai, I'm worried about Google's market power, how it concentrates that power, and then ultimately how it wields it. My question, Mr. Pichai, is did you weigh the input from your employees when making the decision to abandon Project Maven with the United States military? And Pichai, CEO of Google, re responds, Congressman, thank you for your concern. As I said earlier, we are deeply committed to supporting the military and the US government, which is you know, basically a US representative bullying um, the CEO of a major company into restating the fact that he is uh, pledging his allegiance uh, to these other, other machines. And so what we saw through the, the Pompeo administration, through the Trump administration and Pompeo's uh, handling of the Department of State is this idea of the clean network, basically where the US was, was trying to exclude China from all the layers of the internet stack. So we can see the hourglass model on, on the one side and uh, the clean network on the other, and it's basically uh, a mirror. So whereas China was you know, creating a firewall around itself uh, during the past 20 years, it seems that now the US is trying to create a firewall around China. And so what I argue is that um, what we can see is that these lock, lock, lockouts and blockages are controlled demolition tools, right? The internet is always an only becoming. And so we should understand this process of re-networking as one of as a similar to the sport of curling, right? Where each action is a minor sweep towards the re-networking away from nodes that might be beyond the US control. And so for every action, we see a, a reaction. We see that Git co confirms its blocked developers in Iran. Shortly after we see Russia starts testing its own internal internet. We see Adobe um, was meant to be cutting off users in Venezuela. We see that Beijing orders state officials to replace foreign PCs and software. We see that Facebook creates an exception that put that allows users to call for the killing of Putin and, and Russian soldiers. We see that Russia immediately um, blocks access to Facebook. So in conclusion, what, what I argue is that um, we shouldn't understand fragmentation as a full decoupling, but rather as the re-networking um, that shapes the topography of the network in ways that modify the flow of data between different actors. Um, and we should understand that the US is undermining the, the global internet out of concern of having a powerful machine turned against it. We should understand that China, India, the UE, the EU, and others see anxiety with a system that has become critical to its economy and society, but over which they have literal leverage through existing governance mechanisms. And others, uh, smaller countries in terms of population or their economy that bought into phase one, this idea of the global internet uh, infrastructure, but now see they have little bargaining power. And so I think we might see uh, coalitions emerge. There's a lot of talk about uh, the BRICS at this point and how that might play for smaller countries like my own, Argentina, but also we might see uh, the resurgence of something like the non-aligned movement uh, or, or a non-aligned technology movement, uh, a movement in which I participate, for example. Um, and a way forward, perhaps, antitrust efforts in the US could operate as a technological disarmament for the US and, and others. Um, so I'll open now for questions, uh, comments, and suggestions. Um, that is my email, my Twitter handle, and through that um, you can access the, the paper through that QR code. Thank you so much. Let me know if you have any questions or, or comments. I'm happy to take them through the chat or or you can speak up if, if you would prefer. Hey, Juan, thanks. That was a great presentation. Uh, looking forward to reading the paper.
what do you mean in your conclusion? Can you expound on the machine that the U.S. is worried about having turned against it? What exactly do you yes. mean? So what, what I'm arguing is that the, um, the process of centralization that happened throughout the second phase um, is, is one that allowed the U.S. government to leverage um, this centralization for two purposes. On the one hand, um, to pull data from its targets. Basically, if everyone is using Facebook, if everyone is using uh, Gmail, et cetera, then the US government can access information from its targets by leveraging the centralized internet. On the other hand, through this consolidation, it can more uh, easily push data into countries that might be trying to limit its circulation. So for example, we have seen, and I, and I show some examples in, in the paper, how GitHub ha is, is being leveraged uh, within China, for example, um, by uh, US aligned nonprofits to push information into China. Why? Because if China wants to block the circulation of such information uh, through GitHub, then it has to block GitHub as a whole. Right? And so the fact that GitHub has become so central for the developer community within China means that China has to choose whether it blocks GitHub as a whole um, or if it allows certain information to be circulating through uh, GitHub as being promoted by the Department of State. Does that answer your question? And so the, the, the risk that perhaps the US government is seeing is that those actors might stop responding to the US government and start responding to others. And so we have seen over the past um, couple of months, for example, that some of these, um, some of these companies have become uh, more responsive to other governments. For example, we saw that last year, uh, Microsoft with its search engine Bing had blocked images of Tankman, the, the person who was standing in front of the tank in the Tiananmen Square, for example. Um, or we have seen recently that Apple um, limited the use of uh, airdrop in, in China. So we see that some of these companies are starting uh, to respond to the requests of other, other countries, in this case, China, in ways that the US perhaps wouldn't have expected 10 years ago. And so the question would be, if uh, either these companies themselves or equivalent companies start responding to other to the interests of other countries or other governments in ways that would be to the detriment of the U.S. interest. And so one of the strategies that the U.S. Uh, might try to deploy is curtail those other governments uh, from participating in its network so that they can't exercise uh, that influence over companies uh, that have become so central. So is that... As a follow-up question, uh, is that what the U.S. might be worried about with the Huawei, maybe in the global south, Huawei taking the market share of data flows in their own firewall? Exactly. That is precisely what is happening with, with Huawei. Huawei is uh, arguably the leading company in terms of 5G technology. And so one of the concerns that the U.S. would have is that in the coming years, Huawei would be the equivalent of some of those companies that it listed in, in its slide deck, right? So if, if Huawei becomes central, then Huawei, one, will not be within the U.S. Uh, um, control. And so it wouldn't be one of the companies that would be supplying the U.S. with the possibility of pulling data or pushing data. But on the same, on the same, at the same time, it might be providing the government of China with similar capabilities. And that is why I argue that perhaps the, the more interesting or the more useful approach and one that should be promoted through a forum like IGF is uh, technological disarmament, right? That perhaps we shouldn't have companies uh, that have such power, such market control, that they can be used in, in this way. I see that uh, we have a um, participant online with uh, their hand up. I mean, if you, do you want me to read the question or, or should I read it myself? It's better if you read the question. Okay, so Amir Mokabedi states, what is the relationship between the unilateral coercive measure, UCM, in the digital world and internet fragmentation, especially internet-related sanctions in domains like access, digital resources, technology, and capacity building, 
that are being applied by some states against other nations, that could be a great barrier towards development goals and constitutes violation of human rights obligations. Um, Yes, I think these uh, these course of measures are, are are growing in in the paper I document uh, the degree to which um, the U.S. has increased the number of sanctions, uh, the use of sanctions. So in the past uh, twenty years, this has gone up by nine hundred and thirty three percent, if I recall correctly. Um, and in many cases, these are unilateral sanctions, meaning that the U.S. government is deploying them. Um, unilaterally. And I think this is highly problematic for, for internet governance uh, as such. Uh, and it, it also um, explains, in my opinion, why we're seeing this re-networking. It's not simply that, that the US is promoting re-networking, but as we were seeing through some of the examples that other countries are starting to try to reduce their dependence on some of these corporations because they see it as a, as a systemic risk uh, to their economies, to their uh, to their politics, uh, et cetera. And it's not simply um, out of concern of the US government, but centralization creates um, a, a critical risk uh, more broadly. So we saw, for example, a couple of months ago, Kakao talk in, in Korea that is central to, to Korea. Everything in Korea goes through Kakao talk. It collapsed for a couple of hours and they were calculating the, the losses in, in the millions. Uh, of dollars, right? And so we see that this, uh, this centralization is problematic even beyond the risks uh, entailed by, um, by the pull and push powers of a, of a great power. Um, yes, if the session facilitator could, could unmute um, Adam Sable that has his hand up. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you for this very interesting um, thesis and paper. I look forward to reading it. Um, but uh, so the EU is, you know, trying to pass all of these um, pieces of, of legislation in order to gain back some of the power uh, over the Internet that it didn't have in the in phase two. So how do you see those efforts fitting into this picture? I think that's precisely what, what we're seeing now. The question is what type of, what do those efforts look like? I think if, if, we, if we move into a future in which every country is setting up a firewall uh, because it sees that it's a risk for its, uh, its citizens or its inhabitants to use a company like Facebook because they see Facebook as you know, part of a, a, a surveillance machine or part of a, um, or, or part of a propaganda machine, um, then, you know, it's going to be highly problematic because whatever the EU starts to set up, maybe other countries start to see in the same way. And that's why I think the best way forward would, would, would be one of technological disarmament, one where we agree that some of the, we, we set boundaries on the use of these tools, but also we start creating mechanisms of interoperability so that, you know, we can use different providers across borders and still communicate with each other. And so that requires agreed upon standards, um, right? And I think uh, the way in which we move forward has to, has to incorporate that. So one of the things that I find very interesting of the EU is that through GDPR, for example, um, it, it's taking measures that could be seen as as protectionist, could be seen as you know favoring its own uh, its own business or internet sector, um, but but it's doing it it's doing so in a way that is not framing in a nationalistic way, um, but rather in 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 terms of privacy. And so what was what is likely to happen is that uh, countries throughout South America, for example, will start hosting data within the EU. Um, and so it will give arguably the EU certain capabilities that are now in the hands, say, of the US government. And so I think that is, is, that is going to become problematic unless we set up uh, clear red lines that are enforceable and, and agreements around that. 
Yes, and, and what could be done by the US in this regard? I think we need we need clear clear lines in terms of uh, how how these technologies can be used. I think, as I was mentioning, we should uh, look into the idea of what technological disarmament means. I think, on the one hand, it requires promoting antitrust, both in the US and abroad. We've seen action in the past couple of months in, in China that I think go in the right direction. Um, we should hope to see something similar on the side of the US, and perhaps that could be interpreted uh, on the one hand, in the internal, um, in, in, within the US as a way to enable robust democracy. We have people like Lina Khan arguing that uh, democracy is incompatible with, with monopoly power. And within spaces like the Internet Governance Forum, we could understand that monopolies or, or oligopolies are incompatible with a multi-stakeholder model. Um, and I think that is something that the, the Internet Governance Forum and the UN in general uh, could take uh, in, in moving forward. Yes, if the session facilitator could, could um, allow the person to speak. Um, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Diana, I'm from Jordan. I was wondering if you could uh, give your thoughts on the use of American uh, internet infrastructure in war zones, in places where all forms of democracy that the US advocates for tend to be absent. Uh, for example, there are places in uh, Syria where the government is absent, but WhatsApp is very present uh, among the people and self-organizing. So I was just curious about your thoughts on this. Could you, could you add more, more detail, if you don't mind? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so it seems like the American uh, infrastructure of the internet uh, is regulated by the so-called American values and so on. But then it's also used in places where there is a war, there are human rights abuses, and there is no control over this infrastructure. Um, so I was just wondering about your thoughts. Does this contradict the essential uses of this? And uh, how do these people view this? Well, I think on the one hand, what we see from, from the companies, oftentimes they express that they lack um, the resources to be monitoring what is happening in you know across the world. I think that this is, is not a good response on behalf of the companies. If if you know they, they want to operate globally, they, they should be able to operate um, according to the to the needs of, of their users across across the world. Um, but I do think you strike uh, one of the issues that is at the core, and I think it's it's at the core of, of, of the global debates right now, which is um, how, how are we going to have global companies that at the same time have to respond to, to, to US values in a way that might not necessarily be aligned with human rights or might not necessarily uh, be aligned with the interests of, uh, of people uh, that live in, in other countries. And I think that is at the, at the core of the challenge uh, of a multi-stakeholder model, right? Where, where some of these, the multi-stakeholder model perhaps is designed uh, to go beyond borders, understanding that some of these companies operate beyond these borders. But if at the same time we have direct pressure from, from host governments that can exercise their jurisdiction over these companies, um, then I think uh, we see that this multi-stakeholder model starts to crack. And I think that is something that I'm trying to, to, to describe throughout, throughout the paper and that we will be seeing more of in the coming years. Thank you. You're welcome. So the session facilitator is, is flagging that uh, we're almost out of time. I will try to quickly answer the question forwarded uh, by Sergei uh, Romanov, who states, uh, does the international community recognize the need for new international agreements that harmonize the interaction and role of states, global companies in the ICT sector? It would be useful to prevent using the internet in unilateral purposes. Um, I think this is a, a great question for, for people who are currently at the IGF, and I think this is something that should be central to the conversations that are taking place there uh, at this point. I think uh, 
you know, one of the starting points could be some of the conversations around the Geneva Convention and how it applies in the context uh, of war, but perhaps broadening that to contexts uh, beyond war, because as we're seeing, uh, this happens uh, at a regular basis, both the pulling of information uh, of, in of, of intelligence targets and the pushing of information into um, jurisdictions where the US government has an interest uh, in terms of public diplomacy or propaganda. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and your presence. Uh, you can you can reach out to me over Twitter at quanof9, or or you can find my contact details at quanof.me, uh, my website. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to to get to be with you.